everybody and welcome back to my channel. For those of you that are new here, my name is Emily and I have a an YouTube and Instagram account that are dedicated to Disney, mostly Disneyland Paris, but other things generically Disney too. Head over to my Instagram if you want to see some pictures uh, and welcome to our YouTube channel if it's the first time you're here. As you can see by the title of the video, this is a bit of an intense video to be filming <laughs> uh, and I need to give you all a disclaimer now. I do not claim to know everything about the subjects in my title. I, I don't claim to be any sort of travel agent or anything like that. I am purely telling you guys what I know as a layman, as an everyday person uh, and hopefully my information will help some of you in the build up to travelling in the EU after Brexit and also not even to do with Brexit if you're just travelling to Disneyland Paris and you feel that you don't really know how to drive in France and you're worried about the commute and stuff like that so hopefully I can settle a few anxieties to do with travelling in France at the end of this video. So first things first I'm going to run through the things that you need to take with you when you are driving in France. The French government have a very extensive list of things that you absolutely hands down need when you are in your car in France. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're driving in France, you could be only driving into Calais and you still need these things as a legal requirement in France. So here we go. First things first, it goes without saying, but you need a valid full UK driving licence. Obviously you need that to drive anyway, but some people don't think it's useful to take it with them. You absolutely need to take your driving licence. You need insurance. Uh, so you need the insurance that you would have on your car anyway, but you also need travel insurance uh, to make sure that if anything goes wrong then you are covered. You need some form of ID and personally I would just use my passport because in order to get into France in the first place I need to have my passport with me. So I think the form of ID is, needs to be a photo ID and the passport for me is, is the one that I would use. And you also need to take some sort of vehicle registration document with you as well to prove that the vehicle is in fact yours or that you've hired it. Now those are just the few documents that you will need to take with you to prove that the car is yours and that you are able to drive it. Uh, but now these are the things that are the legal requirements in France when you are driving. You need a warning triangle. This can be put uh, behind your car to warn other drivers that you have stopped if you happen to break down at the side of a, a carriageway in, in some way. You need breathalysers. The suggestion is you should bring two. Um, because, I mean, chances are you're not going to breathalyse children if you've got a family, but the two adults, uh, you definitely need uh, breathalysers with you. Even if you're travelling by yourself, it's very, very useful to have two of them with you. They need to be unused and they need to be the government standard ones. There needs to be a reflective high-vis jacket for every single passenger that is travelling in the car and the rules actually specify they need to be within easy reach of each of the passengers. Uh, so the best thing to do is to put them either all in the glove box or put them each in the door pockets, if there's four of you for instance. These are because if you break down if you have an accident and you're at the side of a very busy road, high-vis jackets are very important to make sure that you are seen by other drivers. Headlamp beam uh, deflectors, basically. So these are little stickers that you put on your headlamp. Uh, we would tend to do it when we're actually on the Euro Tunnel when we're crossing. Um, so we put the stickers on the headlamps, it gives you instructions of where you put it and it basically stops you from dazzling the other road users on the opposite side because in England our headlamps kind of slightly go to the left and obviously when you're driving on the right hand side in France going to the left is going to be very bright on the other side of the road. So it just stops that from happening and pushes them the other way and they're just little stickers and they're very easy to use. Uh, you also, when we're talking about stickers, need to have a GB sticker. So if uh, some license plates already have a little GB bit at the side to tell you that your car is from Great Britain, but if you don't have that you need to get a sticker, um, which is easily sourceable, you can get them from online, Amazon, eBay, that sort of place. Uh, you need to have a GB sticker that you need to stick on your car, um, and our old car had a GB sticker on it, but it just stayed there because we went to France so much and we didn't actually ever take it off. So <laughs> yeah, it, it was just moulded onto the car eventually. So, so yes, you need one of them to let them know that your car is from Great Britain. It is worth pointing out that all of the stuff that I've just mentioned um, that you need for legal reasons in your car can be found uh, in places like Argos, RAC, Halfords, stuff like that. You can actually get packs of them. Um, they come in little bags and it's got all of the stuff that you will need in it and it will cost somewhere between 20 to 25 pounds for all of that stuff. So rather than getting everything separately, you can get it all in a big bag. 
And in some regions of France, in the big cities, uh, Paris, Lyon and Grenoble, you, you need to have something called a Crit Air sticker. Uh, so it's C-R-I-T, uh, apostrophe, Air, A-I-R. Um, and it basically is like a, like a London low emissions zone sort of sticker. Uh, and you need to have one of them when you are driving in those cities. If you're thinking about visiting Paris before you go to Disney, that's great, absolutely. But you need one of these Quit Air stickers, otherwise you won't be able to drive in and around Paris. Just to point out, if you're going straight to Disney and not heading towards Paris, you don't need one of those stickers. And last but not least, the legal part of it all. Uh, you absolutely need, if you have a sat-nav, you need to turn off the um, alerts that the sat-nav has, which tells you where the speed cameras are coming up. I've got one, I've got a TomTom -tom sat-nav, and it buzzes at me and makes a little bleepy sound every time a speed camera is coming up to warn me that that's happening. In France, that's absolutely forbidden, it's illegal. So you need to turn off the alerts. If you don't know how to do that before your trip, find a way, find the instructions online, have a little browse on your sat-nav because it's very, very important and you can get penalised if you are stopped by the French police and they find that you have the alerts on your sat-nav. So don't risk it, just turn it off. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual drive to Disney. I am based in Cambridgeshire, so my journey to Calais on a normal day would be Cambridgeshire to Folkestone. And Cambridgeshire to Folkestone is about two and a half hours. Then you have your whole check-in at the Eurotunnel and then you have uh, a 35 minute Euro tunnel journey and then you are in Calais. So all in all, it's probably about three and a half to four hours from my house to Calais. I will talk a little bit about Euro tunnel in just a moment, but for now, I'm gonna just continue my journey. So Calais, once you've arrived in Calais, straight off the Euro tunnel, and it's about a three hour drive to Disneyland Paris. The French roads are far easier to drive on than they are in England so if people are worrying about driving uh, it's actually a very smooth journey it's mostly motorway um, and you have to take the odd turning off occasionally uh, but it really is three hours of pretty much motorway and it's a really easy ride you also have to be aware of tolls so there are toll roads from Calais to Disney you can avoid the toll roads if you've got a sat nav again and you can say please avoid toll roads but that takes about four and a half hours uh, three hours is if you're going through the toll roads. The toll roads cost you about 22 euros. I believe it's 22 euros 70 or 22 euros 40 or something like that. Uh, but it's about 22 euros each way. So when you come back, you have to pay another 22 euros. And the way it works is you drive up to the toll booth. A ticket pops out. You take the ticket and you don't do anything. Just take the ticket. Off you go. When you arrive at the toll booth at the other end, put the ticket in and pay your money. Uh, you can use cash, you can use card. But please be aware if you know that you're going to use either cash or card, they have specific lanes for specific types of payment. So if it's a card, you'll see a little card. If it's a cash, you'll see a bunch of money and some notes. The only thing I would say to be conscious of when it comes to driving in France is if you get confused and a bit disorientated like I do, I need to make sure I'm focusing on the fact that I have to drive on the right hand side and I know that sounds insane and no one should drive anywhere near me when I have to remind myself of that but when it's single carriageway that's fine but when it's dual carriageway that's the confusing bit because I have to think I'm driving on the right hand lane of the dual carriageway and you overtake on the left because to me that's insane same with roundabouts you come up to the roundabout and you go anti-clockwise round a roundabout whereas we do it clockwise here so I have to physically think about those things I promise I'm not an unsafe driver <laughs> I just need to kind of make a mental note to myself you're always on the right hand side and to be honest if you are a bit like that there's no harm in on the dual carriageways always staying in the right hand lane if you're worried about overtaking there's not really anything wrong with that now I'm going to move on to talk about the Eurotunnel itself. Eurotunnel is 100% the preferred way for me and for my family when we've been together to travel to Disney. This upcoming trip in April will be the first time that Ryan has travelled via Eurotunnel with me. I believe he's gone on the Eurotunnel before but on a coach rather than driving. Um, he will be driving this trip. We've got to make sure that all of his car and all of his licences and documents and stuff are all uh, secured. But we are driving, as I said, from Cambridgeshire 
down to Folkestone. When you get to Folkestone, uh, there is a terminal, like a Eurotunnel terminal, um, and you do all your relevant check-in, you, you drive up to this little machine, and it pops out a, a card for you that you hang on your uh, rear view mirror. Um, you don't have to input anything, by the way, it's all done on number plate recognition, which is very good. So you just drive up, they pop out this little card, you hang it on your rear view mirror, and then, once you've done that and you have some time, you can go to the terminal. Uh, the terminal in Britain is called the Victor Hugo Terminal, which makes me laugh because Victor Hugo is a French author. And I believe the French one is called the Charles Dickens Terminal, because that's a British author. So I, I, I quite enjoy that, the, the little connection between England and France. So you can go to the Victor Hugo Terminal, uh, they have food and drink facilities, cafes, coffee shops, they have a Burger King in the French Terminal. But I can't remember if they have a fast food place in the English one. But they definitely have food stuff there, somehow. Um, so yes, you can go to the toilet there, you've got stuff like um, bookshops and you can get magazines and puzzle books and stuff like that there. And I believe there's a little bit of kind of duty free stuff as well. It's nice to chill out in there, it's nice and warm, but also in the car park there's a screen that tells you your, your letter um, and the waiting time that you have until you board. To so say, letter K, uh, now boarding. And once it's changed to that, you see everyone go <laughs> in the same way that you would at an airport. Um, as soon as your, your flight number is announced, then suddenly everyone runs to the gate. It's a bit like that. Um, but it's, it's, we haven't really been at busy times, so it's not really been like a stampede. It's just been a lot of cars all going at the same time. That's what happens, and you get in your car and you drive to the train. You've got to go through security and you've got to go through all the passport control and stuff like that. Once you're on the train, you will either be the ground level or the second level up. It really doesn't matter which one you are because neither of them make any difference to the journey, really. Um, there'll be a little man on the train um, I say a man, it can be a woman, but it's always been a man when we've been there, uh, who basically just goes like this to you, and then will go when he wants you to stop your car, just to make sure that you're the right distance away from the car in front of you. You are all in little carriages, um, parked your cars, you have to keep your car off, and it needs to be parked, and the windows need to be down. Once the train has started, it takes about 30 to 35 minutes to cross, but it doesn't really feel like that at all. By the time you've had a little bit of a stretch, you've walked along the train and you've gone through all of the doors. The doors are great fun, by the way. The doors, um, you need to press like this button and you feel like you should be in like Star Trek or something. You press a button and the doors are really heavy, you've got to push them open um, and you're basically walking in between the train. It's really weird. Um, but once you've had a little bit of a stretch and you've walked around and you've been to the toilet and stuff like that, there are toilets on the train, you've only got a few minutes left and you can start to see France. I personally don't think it's a claustrophobic experience. I'm a little bit worried about that sort of stuff sometimes, but I don't think it's claustrophobic at all because you can walk around, you can go to the toilet and stuff like that. It's not like you're limited when you're on the train. Then, as I said earlier, once you've arrived in France, you basically just drive off the train and off you go. You don't have to stop, you don't have to be welcomed by French customs or anything like that. You just drive off the train and onto the motorway and off you go and then three hours to Disney. I personally love using the Eurotunnel. I think it's really easy, really quick. You can take all the stuff that you want with you, um, whereas if you're flying, obviously you've got the restrictions of weight and what you can put in cabin hold and hand luggage and all that sort of stuff. Whereas when you're driving in the car, you can take whatever can fit in your car with you. So that's really good. It's an easy way to make sure that you can bring souvenirs back with you and you can take your own food and stuff like that. So I really do love the Eurotunnel. I think it's a really quick and easy process. Okay, now we are on to the big B word that I wasn't going to do until after I'd been. But I actually thought, you know what, it's probably useful to some people to know how Brexit might be affecting their travelling to Disney. Particularly if you're going as early as I am. I'm going a week after after Brexit is supposed to supposed to be happening. I'll just point out now that all of these things are going off a no deal Brexit. Um, if for some reason it, Brexit is delayed or if we actually end up getting some sort of a deal then great but for now it's a no deal Brexit situation that I'm talking about. Things that I know so far, again I do not claim to, to know lots of stuff about Brexit, I'm quite in the dark about it to be honest, but 
I've done my research about how travelling in Brexit is going to be affected. So here goes. If you are driving in France or in the EU in general after the 29th of March 2019, you will need an international driving permit. Again, you can apply for these online and depending on which EU country you are driving to will depend on what sort of international driving permit you need. But for France, you can get them online and you need one in addition to your driving license. Your driving license is not a full driving permit internationally and you can't just have your international driving permit and not your driving license. That's so important to remember because a lot of people will bypass that and just go to France and actually find they won't be able to drive there because they haven't got an IDP, which you definitely need when you are going to be driving in France. Another thing to think about is your passport. In order to travel to France after Brexit, you will need at least six months left on your passport. Mine doesn't expire till 2024, so I'm absolutely fine, and Ryan's doesn't expire till 2025, I believe. So from the 29th of March, you need to have six months left on your passport as of the day of travel. Car insurance. Now, car insurance will be somewhat affected by Brexit, it seems, but you need to speak to your insurer themselves to actually confirm whether your car insurance is still going to be valid in the EU after Brexit. The good news is that the European Commission announced back in the end of last year, November sort of time, they announced that we will not need a visa to travel to France yet anyway. It might come into play in a few years time, but in the short aftermath after the Brexit, we are not going to need a visa to travel, which is very good news. Now, just to briefly move on to Disney themselves, Disney have released a statement about Brexit themselves, um, which is very good because I think a lot of people that have Disney holidays shortly after the end of March were panicking a little bit about how Brexit might affect their holiday. I personally don't believe Brexit will affect the holiday. I think a lot of people are scaremongering saying oh we won't even get be able to get into the country and they won't allow English people in and that sort of stuff. I don't believe it's going to be that bad because I don't think people would do that. So Disney have released a statement saying that if for some reason Brexit is the reason that they have to cancel someone's holiday, uh, so for instance if they cancelled our holiday because of Brexit, then they will do everything they can to make sure that they will refund us all of our money from the holiday. But what they have said, not in so many words, it's not the exact words that they've said, but they've kind of suggested that if a no deal Brexit happens and it doesn't affect Disney's running of their holidays, but for some reason we can't get there, so the travel is affected, then it's not Disney's fault and they can't do anything about it. That's that's kind of the suggestion that they've made. Also, please be aware that if you have an EHIC, which is a European health insurance card, uh, that might be affected after Brexit, but no one's really sure. I've just ordered a new one, even though it's a month and a bit until Brexit. I've just ordered a new one, just in case it's not affected. I have every faith that, in fact, I'll have ordered a new one, but we're not going to be able to use it because it will be affected by Brexit, because I'm not really sure why we would leave the EU and then the EU would say, yeah, OK, have free healthcare, that's fine. Um, I, so I do believe that actually the EHICs won't be very uh, useful after Brexit. But I've still ordered one anyway, and I would suggest taking it with you, because if you don't know what's happening with it, you might as well take it. It's not going to take up any space in your luggage. <laughs> so you might as well just take it with you and see just in case. Generally, though, my top tip for travelling during or after Brexit would be allow time allow lots of time. Our tunnel isn't till 12.50 on, on Saturday morning. We are going to be leaving Cambridgeshire at 8 o'clock in the morning possibly, uh, and 8 o'clock in the morning will then give us 4 hours and 50 minutes until our tunnel, and it's only about two and a half hours. So we've got an extra two hours just spare. It could be insane to do that, it could be completely nuts that we've got there two hours early and actually it's clear as a bell and everything's fine. But we're just very aware that it's a week after Brexit and also it's the beginning of the Easter holidays for a lot of England and some of France. So I am just aware that we might have a little bit of uh, waiting to do as it will be lunchtime on a Saturday 
on the first day of the Easter holidays. <laughs> so yes, uh, I definitely would just say allow time. Allow time to travel, allow, allow time to get through customs, allow time to get through passport control. None of us really know what's happening. The government don't know what's happening. Nothing's really certain. So this was my video on traveling in France, driving in France, Euro tunnel, how Brexit might affect it, all that sort of stuff. And I really hope that some of this has been helpful to you guys. Keep a checklist of the stuff that I've mentioned uh, and make sure that you use it to to make your life a little bit easier when you're driving in France. To those of you who might be driving for the first time, very best of luck. I hope that you enjoy it because I certainly do. Listening to Disney tunes for six hours straight is pretty much the dream. <laughs> I hope you all have a wonderful week and a wonderful holiday if you are heading off soon. I will see you next week for the next vlog where I'll be talking about my feelings about Tower of Terror. I will see you all next week.